Welcome everybody to the fourth hands-on Agile webinar. Today we will be talking about Agile failure patterns. I'm your host, Stefan Wolpes. This webinar is not intended to be some kind of complaining session. It's about pointing at issues that are usually located outside the sphere of influence of the Scrum team, the Scrum master or Agile coach, and that are likely to derail or stall a transition effort to become an agile organization. So in my experience, functional silos, rigid budgeting process, and hierarchies from the heydays of the Ford Motor Company prove to be a really fertile ground for agile transitions to fail. There are, in the end, numerous signs of failures depending on the context of the organization its size, its history, the products, what markets you are addressing, in which part of the world you are actually working. So I picked basically my dirty dozen and I arranged them into three categories. Systemic issues, personal issues, and tech, team, and facility issues. Please keep in mind when we go through a few slides now that companies are complex systems and systems thinking is one of the major requirements that you need to apply to understand why things are not going the way they're supposed to go. Not having a vision. Let me cite Lewis Carroll. If you don't know where you're going, any road will get you there. And this is exactly the most problematic issue in my experience. Having a vision is crucial to get everyone on the same page and answering the why in the Simon Sinek's why, how, and what question. Or if you prefer Daniel Pink over Simon Sinek, provide the purpose in what is motivating today's knowledge workers in the autonomy, mastery, and purpose realm. I sincerely believe that staying in the business, growing the business, scaling the business, probably by mergers and acquisitions, making more revenue, making more private, increasing shareholder value are not a vision. Those are side effects of a successfully executed strategy based on an appealing vision. If you don't have a vision, if you don't know where you're going, why would the rest of the organization basically follow you? Number two, is agile a fat or a trend? This is rather closely related to the problem with not having a vision. If you're not having a vision, your leadership will very likely not fully support an agile transition. And this is the issue. The leadership, the C-level, has a role model function from my perspective. Everyone in the organization is looking at the C-level and how the C-level is actually living these ideas. If the leader is not fully in, why should I be in? Maybe it goes away in a few months. Why should I commit myself now to something that probably five months down the road will be of no interest to the organization whatsoever? In my experience, whenever you come to an organization and you try to change the organization, there may be around 10% plus minus 5 percentage points of change agents. So people that will embrace the change that will actually become a pillar of change in the process. You will always encounter 10 to 15% of refuseniks. So people that are opposing, that are pushing back, that are not willing to change because the current situation offers a lot of advantages to them. And the rest is a silent majority. I simply wait and try to figure out in which direction the wind is blowing and where everyone is moving, and then they will join at a later stage. So if your leadership is not fully supporting becoming an agile organization, you are in trouble. If you can never experience gamba walks when your management comes to the shop floor or the team space where value is actually created, if they never attend ceremonies or meetups that you're organizing, if they never point at successes and failures in reports or the weekly newsletter that they're sending out to the organization or the monthly newsletter, whatever that is, something is not going according to plan. Something is wrong. Number three, projects, budgets, and stage gates. Also known as we know what to build. This is typical for organizations that nominally adapt agile ideas, but internally stick with the old ways of figuring out what's worth building. And that typically goes like, 
someone from the management has an idea and is pitching that idea to the higher management. If the idea is finding sufficient support, it will be funded by allocating budget. And then the idea provider will start building a project team that will work on his or her idea. So the product department in that setup will always be some kind of internal agency that is delivering what the owner of the budget is expecting to be delivered. And you will find numerous ways how this is basically presenting itself in the daily life of the organization. You know, for example, think of the project management office now is still active, it just becomes probably relabeled. Think of metered funding. So your project is not funded for the intended period of time or the teams are not funded, for example, a whole fiscal year, but every two or three months, you basically have to back for new money to continue the development effort of the product you're working on. You have to deliver status reports or you have to participate in status meetings that are totally unrelated to any kind of ceremonies that you're having anyway. You get requests from finance where you are supposed to detail what investment was allocated to which kind of feature. You know, so they can break down how to work on the next ledger. You will find this typically in organizations in very early stages of agile transitions, and it leads typically to local optimization efforts within the silos of that organization. So whenever you come across someone demanding status reports from you, you immediately understand that something is wrong. Number four, there is no failure culture. No one is celebrating failure. And by failure really means celebrating it. The problem is if you're not celebrating failure as an integral part of the learning process, if failure has not just a negative connotation, but probably a negative influence on your future career in that organization, everyone will be playing safe. Why would you risk something that might result in failure if the organization is not appreciative of your effort and is not willing to understand the learning that you made and is willing to pay for that learning, by the way, in the end too. This whole concept where failure is not an option, we don't want to fail forward, we don't want to learn by failure, leads to this typical short-termism, you know, quarterly results are more important than innovation in the end. It leads to incrementalism, you know, step by step, slowly, very balanced, risk mitigated, which has the effect that, for example, a traditional organization would never have come up with the idea to create Twitter because no one was asking for Twitter. No one had an idea what Twitter actually is. They stumbled upon that by accident. And now it's a 20 plus billion dollar company. So it's no surprise to me that Twitter was not invented within a traditional organization. It also leads to what Clayton Christensen in his book described as the innovator's dilemma. You're not willing to sacrifice your cash cow in order to become more innovative and figure things out for the future. You're not willing to cannibalize your existing business models to probably position yourself better in the increasing competition five years from now. Think Blockbuster and Netflix. There's a reason why Blockbuster went out of business and Netflix is now the predominant streaming service around the world. Speaking of Netflix, just dig bit into this idea of having a chaos monkey that is deliberately turning off and shutting down integral components of your infrastructure to check the level of resilience that you have. You know, this is unheard of in traditional companies where I say, no, we don't want to have failure. We're not planning to test this, right? By the way, chaos monkey, people now provide this as a service to everyone. So resilience is the goal and failure is an option. You know, Six Sigma is great for cars, but not necessarily for software. And we're still talking about software here. So not having a failure culture is massively impeding any form of agile transition. Number five, efficiency and utilization fetish. This always happens in my experience when there is no trust in teams. And the middle management believes that they actually need to be told what to do and how to do this. For example, engineers are supposed to deliver code. They're not supposed to talk to customers or take over customer support duties to get first-hand experience of customer problems. The typical explanation for that is 
well, we have the customer care people for that. And by the way, they're just $15 an hour and not 75 or whatever the engineer is being paid. So the engineers are considered to be way too expensive to actually do this minor tasks. Now, the problem is, if you put a team on a path to solve a customer problem, coding the solution that delivers actually what the customer wants, in the end, is maybe 30 to 40% of the whole effort. Everything before is actually figuring out what to build or more precisely, what not to build. And you can't overestimate the positive effects when the engineers talk directly to the customers. So being focused on efficiency and utilization is pure Taylorism at work in my perspective. You know, it's completely output oriented. The problem is that we're no longer assembling Model Ts, but we're going every day where no one has ever gone before. So what we're here building here has actually never been built before. And that's why the old rules of focus on efficiency and utilization are no longer working and they are really a bad sign for the ongoing transition process. Number six, silos have a different speed. Let me tell you a story. One of my teams built an excellent continuous delivery system. They basically could deliver to production at will by pushing a button. The problem was that the legal and governance folks insisted on having at least a week in advance to check whether that would be okay, what they would want to push to production. And it was a hard negotiation to actually get into this one week slot. Originally, they wanted to have two weeks for that. Now imagine Amazon is delivering new code to production environments every minute in its empire of applications that they're running. Think about how a legal organization will be able to check what the teams are doing at this pace. It's practically impossible. And this is the whole idea behind it. You have to need to trust the teams that they get the job right, that they understand accountability on their side also, that they are aware of the legal requirements and that they take them into consideration appropriately in advance. So if you notice that your organization is moving at different speeds, that part of your organizations are moving at different speeds, and the slowest silo, so to speak, determines the speed of the convoy of the organization, then something is really, really not working out right that should be addressed by the higher management levels. Funny thing is, I mean, the legal folks always have this idea of, okay, we need to check what you're here delivering here, which is quite simple if you try to understand how a new terms and condition page is working, but they basically cannot understand the new trading algorithms for derivatives, right? So silos and different speeds. Number seven, what is Infomies syndrome? Not everyone in your organization will love Agile for a very simple reason. Accepting accountability, all the hype of teamwork and creating long-living teams, all this transparency is not appealing to everyone. Some people like to be told what to do. They trade a part of their life to make ends meet. Other people were trained to become managers, to become the people others go to when they have a problem and they have to come up with an answer. And it's a well-paid job, they were told. Now, point is, if you're going agile, a lot of people will actually be pushed out of their comfort zones. So on the one side, they need to accept probably accountability. On the other side, they are no longer required to be these people who actually make things happen because that is part of the team's job to figure out how that is working. So in a lot of cases, a personal agenda is colliding with the bigger picture of the agile transition. In an agile setup, for example, you can no longer run CV optimizations for your next career step by running a pet project, for example. Or you can no longer push for features being delivered because your individual bonus is depending on them. It's simply no longer working. Checks and balances, that's the great advantage of an agile organization. And these people exactly know that this is not in their favor. Number eight, closely related, Taylorism and micromanagement. We've already been talking about utilization and resource efficiency based on the ideas of Mr. Taylor and Mr. Ford. Point is, we're no longer training farm boys to pick up a tool at an assembly line. The idea that the manager is the benevolent superior who knows what to do and how to solve problems is completely outdated. On the other side, try walking in their shoes if they fall back in these kind of categories. 
Would you entrust your career a bunch of hoodie-wearing nerds? Would you risk your ability to pay back your student loans or your mortgage or support your family that a bunch of people is making the right decisions that will support your standing in the organization? A lot of people don't think so. They believe they have to do what is necessary and tell other people what to do. No one is teaching servant leadership in business schools. And the result sometimes is, like the CEO of Haya, the Chinese appliance manufacturer, recently mentioned in an interview that they started the transition with making about 10,000 managers redundant because they were not providing value to the customers. And this, this is the fear. Remember when Zappos was going in full holacracy, they lost about 15, 16% of the staff because all those people who didn't want to go that route, who said, no, I didn't join here to lose my title and my career. I go somewhere else and I switch to a more traditional role model. Number nine, misaligned incentives. The problem in agile environments is that the team wins and the team loses. And this is a very tricky thing, the moment that individual and team incentives are not aligned. The classic case is that the bonus is at risk. You know, so shortly before the end of the sales quarter, the product team gets flooded with requests for urgent features that need to be shipped as soon as possible in the hope that the sales teams will actually create some additional revenue based on these new features. Or they start selling features to close contracts that are actually non-existing without talking to you before. All of these are directly resulting from a misalignment of incentives. If you want to become an agile organization, you must overhaul the bonus structure at the same time to avoid moral hazards. There is no other way. The moment a company claims they can become a learning organization without changing their incentives and bonus structure, something is wrong. They're not serious about this. Number 10, an outdated tech stack. I strongly believe that to be successful as an agile organization, teams need to be able to pick their own tech stack. If the teams are supposed to be accountable and if commitments are demanded from them, they need to have a say on what kind of technology they are actually using to make this happen. It doesn't mean that there is no guidance there is chaos. It's completely okay to say as a company rule, going on AWS is fine with us, but you cannot go to Google. It's totally fine. However, the team in the end needs to be able to pick the tech stack. You will not find talent that is working for creating an agile organization if they have to work on a Microsoft stack, if they are forced to work on a Microsoft stack. It's simply not working. So there are a lot of facets to this point, starting with bring your own device. If people like to work on their MacBooks, so let them. If they like to work on their Linux laptops, let them. And if some folks still want to work on Windows PCs, that's fine too. Just set everything up in a way that they actually can all contribute to the team success. You know, if they want to go into the cloud, let them go into the cloud. On-premise is basically obsolete and outdated for most of the applications at the moment. If you're ignoring these kind of ideas, you will have a very hard stand in the war for talent. You will not find the appropriate people who would like to join your organization. So rest assured, if you want to become agile, you need to put a lot of money probably into your tech stack and infrastructure to make this work. Number 11, team building. This is a fun section because there are so many different aspects here. So, for example, you're still running component teams instead of cross-functional teams that are able to deliver a part of the solution end-to-end. -end. This is a very common setup in a lot of legacy organizations. It leads to a lot of nasty effects like people assume ownership of certain parts of the code and no one else is allowed to touch that part of the code. It leads to numerous dependencies and handovers and delays. So whenever you go into flow and cost of delay, you will certainly have your fun with component teams. If you stick with them, Agile might not work out in the way you expect it to work out. There is no self-selection of teams practice. So teams are set up by the line management or HR, instead of bringing all the people into one room and to find that you need to have one, two or three teams and you just say, okay, the teams consist 
or comprise of the following roles. And now please have fun and make it happen. I come back in an hour and then I would like to know who's working with whom. This may sound a bit strange in the beginning, but rest assured it works. I'm regularly practicing this. And by the way, it was also practiced by the Royal Air Force to find bomber crews in World War II. So it's really not a new approach to team building. Another critical issue is longevity of teams. Shifting people around, having people work on multiple teams at the same time or even different projects is not helping the team to achieve peak performance. There is a very good reason why the Navy SEALs work in teams and why these teams stick together for years. And even this is not a new idea. Uh, the smallest unit of the Roman army were eight legionaries sharing a tent. The Contubernium, I think I slaughtered the word currently at the moment. <laughs> but the idea that people need to work together for a longer period of time so trust can build is important and it's not new. Which brings me to the next point, peer recruiting. If teams do not have the final say in recruiting new team members, if HR and line management are still pulling the strings here, you're also not moving in the right direction. How do you suppose is a team able to make a commitment and accept accountability if team members are pressed into service of that team without their consent? This is not working and it's completely unagile. Once again, we have Taylorism working here. There's an opening and the opening will be filled no matter if that person is actually a good addition to the team or not. Traditional HR career planning. This is another issue, very popular in large organizations because they always have to provide you with some kind of career path and planning ahead. For example, they like to give out titles like lead developer or senior developer, which is a critical thing because in Scrum, for example, we don't know lead developers. You know, it's all based on your merits, on the respect you earn when working with the other team members, but it's certainly not by being handed a new business card. So you need to have cross-functional teams. The team should select themselves. They should stay together as long as possible. The team needs to have the final say in who's joining the team and just abandon these old HR career planning things, title are of no interest whatsoever. Inadequate facilities. Agile is expensive, at least at the beginning, because you cannot run Agile with multiple teams in mere open space. It simply does not work this way. You need various kind of spaces because otherwise it will have serious implications for the productivity of the team. So first of all, we need large and flexible spaces for training, public ceremonies, for example, sprint reviews or workshops. Imagine you want to run a sprint review with 50 or 60 people attending, which actually is the goal. It's not going to work if you have, a, say, 40 square meter meeting room where you can basically squeeze 15 people in. Also, if you like to regularly run user story mappings, you need at least 10, 12 meters of wall where you can actually work. And you need an adequate space around that because otherwise the working will become unpleasant and unproductive. You need a lot of space for whiteboards, for visualizations. I mean, Transparency is the heart of everything in Agile. It's not just the sprint boards. Have the product backlog, have the product roadmap, detail technical debt, make sketches of the architecture, etc. PP. There are a lot of usage for whiteboards and you can't have enough whiteboards in my experience. So my current client invested in about 20, 25 meters of whiteboard from the bottom to the floor. So we have really a nice setup at the moment, but this is not common. The team requires a defined team space from my perspective. And by team space, I'm not referring to 40 square meters cordoned off somewhere in an open space. This is not a team space. You must be able to practically close the door and open it at the same time. There are solutions for that, but the typical open space is certainly not among them. You need to have space for collaborating in small teams of two or maybe five or six people. You also need to have silent workspace for deep focused work. You need to be able to go somewhere, close the door behind you, and then be left alone for the next three or four hours to figure out a really important issue. It would be great to have space for informal ad hoc meetings of two or three people. 
that are not disturbing anyone else of the team at the same time. Social spaces, e.g. cafe, is massively important. At the moment, we get a lot of work done by using the cafeteria, which is really a great place. And finally, you need a budget for regular off-site events. Say if you go somewhere else, you're pushing people out of their comfort zone. So deeply ingrained in our DNA is still the urge to watch out for the saber-toothed tigers that might be lurking around somewhere in the vicinity of this new space. And that heightened attention actually has a positive impact on the work the team can do in a different environment. However, you need to have a budget for that. And typically, if the company needs to save some money, this is the first thing to go. So that were my dirty dozens. Let's quickly have some recap. We started with not having a vision, not knowing where to go. We were asking, is Agile a fat or a trend in the organization? Is actually the management, the C-level going full in and is living up to its role model function within the organization? Then we were asking about, is the organization still sticking with the old ways of figuring out what's worth building? So do you still have stage gates and this hardcore budgeting process where projects get funded but not teams? And how does it all work? Are product teams more or less treated like internal agencies? The lack of a failure culture is also a typical anti-pattern that you will find in organizations probably at the early stage, but also in a lot of later stages. If there's still no failure culture at the later stage, say 12 or 18 months into the transition period, it's a good indicator that you will actually fail transitioning to a learning organization. Efficiency and utilization, this is basically Taylorism transferred into the 21st century. So there's an idea that everyone has a role and that individual is just working inside the role instead of understanding that the team is tasked with solving problems and that the team knows best how to do that because they're closest to the problem. Then we have the issue with different silos within the organization moving at different speed. For example, legal is always a challenge if you actually try to become more modern by, for example, by setting up a productive continuous delivery pipeline and a resilient system. Then we switch to personal issues, mainly the what is in for me syndrome. So what am I gaining from agile transitions? Is this the right place for me or not? Or am I no longer willing to deal with all this transparency and team hype, et cetera, PP? Related to that is the tendency of the middle management to get back to tailorism and micromanagement, telling people what to do and how to do things instead of trusting the team, figuring out what the best solution is in any given situation. And we were briefly addressing the issue of misaligned incentives. The organization is not addressing the issue that the personal incentives are misaligned with the team incentives or the organizational incentives and that you thus may create moral hazard, which is certainly impeding the whole progress of the agile transition. Outdated tech stacks. If you want to become agile, you need to massively invest in your tech stack. For a lot of large and established organizations, it means to warm up to the idea to go into the cloud and accept open source solutions and that people bring their own devices or that people choose different devices they like to work on. Team building covers a lot of issues from having cross-functional teams that are long-living, that are probably self-selected or even peer-recruited, that are no longer subject to traditional HR career development path, but something different that is more compatible with agile ways of thinking. And lastly, if you want agile to succeed, you simply need to have space. Agile requires space. It's not working in large open space offices and you cannot align 25 cubicles and then call that a product team or something like that. It's simply not working. You need a lot of space for different kinds of works. And there are various studies out there that prove that having different kind of environments is a very good way to stimulate creativity and productivity. So it's not a waste of budget but from my perspective, an essential if you want to become an agile organization.